Welcome to our episode on geopolitics with Alex and today it's actually going to be quite different. Um, I'm going to be talking about a book uh, that I'm in the process of writing and hoping that uh, you will give me as much feedback uh, as possible. So the book that I'm working on uh, has the working title Order in a World of Disorder. So it's basically about geopolitics. I'm humming and hawing a little bit about the subtitle. One of them uh, is about how uh, conflict, competition and cooperation will shape the 21st century. And the other one is this concept that I'm launching or actually launched already in 2009 called Dignified Foreign Policy. In any which case, this book is really about international relations. And what I wanted to do today is to test three theses about the book and then walk you through the structure of the book and then hopefully get uh, some of your uh, ideas, comments, questions and observations as I continue uh, to write it. Uh, the time frame is I'm hoping to finish it within, say, three to six months and publish it uh, in uh, about a year. Uh, the length of the book will actually be hopefully short, about 200 pages. Uh, and the style of the book is on one hand academic, but on the other hand also personal. So I'm trying to bring in my experience from the academic world, in other words, theory and practical experience. So there'll be a lot of uh, anecdotes in it as well. So the book is called, the big title, Order in a World of Disorder. Now, the three theses that I will read out to you uh, are the following. The first one is, uh, in the coming years, a multipolar world will be led by three power centers, China, the United States and the European Union, all which represent over 50% of world GDP. They will, however, be challenged by an array of states, regions and non-state actors uh, from all around the world. Alliances will be fluid, some of them based on values, others on interests. No single center will dominate global politics. That's thesis number one. Thesis number two, China and the United States will be the main rivals. They will compete but not fall into conflict. The EU will side with the US on most issues, but also increase its own strategic autonomy in dealing with China and other global players. The US and the EU will struggle to build global alliances that follow essentially Western values and Western interests. At the end of the day, it's about diplomacy and the norms and institutions that will govern a rules-based world order. So, kind of arguing that there is an end of Western dominance. My third and final thesis is the following. The new world order will be determined by the capacity of different power centers and challengers to project hard, soft and smart power. If a liberal, rules-based world order is to be maintained, the US and the EU will have to embrace a more dignified foreign policy, that is, a policy grounded in mutual respect and dialogue. They have to lead by way of example, not force or arrogance. They have to show that democracies are better than autocracies at coping with local, national and global challenges. So those are the three basic theses uh, of the book. A lot of the ideas uh, you will have heard if you followed our first uh, season of lectures uh, branded under Understanding the War or now this second season uh, with geopolitics with uh, Alex. Now, what I've written so far are the thesis, there are a few more. Uh, I have also written a book pitch, I have written a preface uh, and an introduction. 
So I have a structure of the book, and in the book pitch I have one paragraph under uh, each, uh, each part. Now what I wanted to do next is to basically give you the structure uh, of the book. So the book uh, basically has a preface, uh, and in this preface I talk about uh, what you've heard before. We have a tendency to over-rationalize the past. Uh, over-dramatize the present and therefore underestimate the future. I also talk about my personal experience as Prime Minister and why I think that it's both the best and the worst job um, in uh, a democracy. And I also make an argument why I think it's quite useful to write a book which is grounded in both uh, academic theory and uh, in political practice. So this is kind of the personal statement, if you will. Second, uh, after the preface, I have an introduction which basically sets the scene of the book. It talks about why the order, balance and dynamics of power matter. It talks about crisis, chaos and suboptimal solution, solutions. And it talks about why freedom will always provide better societies than control, essentially why I think that democracy is, is better than autocracy. And it also launches the concept uh, of dignified uh, foreign policy, especially as a message uh, to the West. Then I frame the book in three parts, surprise, surprise, and each of the three parts have, surprise, surprise, three chapters. This is the way in which I keep my head sane and hopefully the uh, reader interested. I should say that every part and every chapter starts with this one sort of paragraph which is sort of throws in the reader into what is happening. So for instance the introduction starts with a text message, message exchange that I had with Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov three days into the war. I won't reveal more at this stage um, but it, it, it does set the frame for the, for the book and why I think we have moved from uh, order to uh, disorder. So I try to sort of make the book as, as live as possible. So part one of the book is about the order of power. Part two of the book is about the balance of power. And part three of the book uh, is about the dynamics of the power. And let me just run through uh, the three parts quickly and separately. So the order of power is basically about the evolution that we have seen with hard power, soft power and smart power since World War II. And you can imagine that it basically goes through the three chapters and the three phases. So chapter one is about a bipolar Cold War, which is basically ideological, based on two centers of power, the Soviet Union and the United States. The Soviet Union speaking the language of communism, controlled economies and authoritarian regimes, and the United States speaking the language of democracy, capitalism and freedom. And of course, this phase ends with the victory of the West and the United States, the end of the Cold War in 1989 or 1991, depending a little bit on uh, which part uh, you want to focus on. The second chapter is about a multipolar uh, post-Cold War. Sorry, I correct myself, a unipolar uh, post-Cold War. So the argument is that after the Soviet Union collapses, we believe in the end of history, in other words, that all 200 nation states move towards liberal democracy, social market economy and globalization, and it is unipolar led by the United States. This then runs through the 1990s un until we start a slow move towards a multipolar world. 9-11, the financial crisis, um, the euro crisis, um, the asylum crisis, the election of Trump, Brexit, uh, Covid, etc., uh, etc. Et 
So we start this slide where Fareed Zakaria talked about uh, the rise of the rest or the rise of the others, and we begin to see the emergence of a multipolar world. And remember that the world is much more orderly when it's bipolar or unipolar than when it's multipolar. So I go through that, the rise of China, I look at you know, what happened in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, uh, 9-11, and how Western hegemony basically starts to uh, decline. And we start moving towards a, a, a multipolar uh, world. And this is where I come to chapter three, where I talk about uh, a multipolar world of disorder. Of course, it has the three power centers that I mentioned in my thesis, uh, China, the United States and the European Union, but there are a lot of challengers coming in. Some of them are states like, say, India, or already established powers like Japan and, and Korea, other emerging powers from Brazil and, and from Nigeria, South Africa. Uh, you know, the situation in the Gulf region, the Middle East has changed, the energy game and the rest of it. So, so we're essentially in chapter three witnessing a, a more uh, messy uh, world. So that's the first part of the book, talking about what the order looks like. Second part of the book is about the balance of power. And here the argument is that it's basically a balance between the West and the rest. I'm simplifying here, but if you really want to simplify, you could argue that the West would say that the world right now is witnessing a phase where you have democracy versus autocracy, whereas the rest of the world is saying that, no, 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 this is as much about the West versus the rest, where the basic argument is that you in the West, you established the international institutions, say through Bretton Woods and IMF, the World Bank or GATT, which then became the WTO, you have been the rule setters after World War II and after the Cold War, now it's our time to get a little bit skin uh, in the game. So this is the, the balance of power that, that we're dealing with. And here, of course, again, I go through three chapters, so chapters four, five, and six. Chapter four is about political power. So which one is the more viable system of governance? Is it democracy or autocracy? And as a matter of fact, there are a lot of countries that fall in, in, in between uh, the two. So this is about the balance between individual uh, and the state, about liberty and control, about uh, private and public. It's also strongly linked, of course, to values. I mean, do we have universal values? Well, you know, there are countries like, like China that would contest and say that, well, the universal values, actually, they're Western values. So they're the ones that you guys want, not the one that, that we want. So this is in many ways quite an interesting uh, conversation to, to have. Uh, then chapter five is about economic power. And here, of course, it, it's about, okay, you know, what's a better system? Complete free market capitalism or state capitalism? You know, do you want deregulation or regulation? And, and you know, do you want Adam Smith or do you want Karl Marx? And I'm, of course, simplifying here uh, a little bit. Uh, but, but remember that there was a time, especially after the Cold War, when it was all about market, 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 and all about getting rid of the state, right? But then, you know, China started to show through various means of state capitalism that you can actually have a growth with the combination of, of, of both. So it's a conversation about what economic power actually means. And chapter six in this part uh, two then is about transnational power. Of course, I have to have that right because I'm the director at the School of Transnational Governance here at the European University Institute in Florence. But the argument I think is very valid that we don't live in a world anymore which is purely about you know, state or, or market. And it's not about governments and civil service running the show. The nexus of power is actually much more multifaceted and complex. Uh, some people talk about networks. I talk about transnational governance, which means that in order for a decision to be churned out, it has to see some government, civil service, NGOs and civil society, the private sector, journalism, academia, 
all of these different things uh, play in the game. And some of it is about global pressure, some about local and national pressure, and some about uh, regional uh, pressure uh, as well. So the second part is about the balance of power, in other words, political power, economic power, and transnational power. Then finally and thirdly, I go to the third part of the book, which is about the dynamics of power. And here my argument is that the dynamics of power will be dealt with in, on three levels, therefore three chapters, seven, eight, and nine. One of them is conflict, the second one is competition, and the third one uh, is cooperation. And this is where I start introducing uh, the concept also of, of uh, a dignified foreign policy. So my argument is that if the West, so mainly the United States and the European Union, want to ma maintain a liberal world order based on rules, norms and institutions, it has to drive a more dignified foreign policy. It cannot anymore export democracy by uh, force, as it did, for instance, or tried to do in Iraq or in Afghanistan, uh, and it cannot act as arrogantly it, as it has. It has to take the rest of the world uh, into consideration. And on top of that, it has to actually correct many of the paradoxes and discrepancies of its own system. Because, I mean, uh, uh, let's be honest, not all European states are 100% liberal democracies. The United States has problems with democracy, both with right-wing and left-wing extremists. The United States is not part of all international organizations like the international uh, courts. So, you know, we have to put our money where our mouth is. So on, in chapter 7 I look at conflict and, and, and the argument here is that we'll continue to have local conflict, say Yemen or South uh, Sudan, uh, but we're also seeing nation-based conflict, say Ukraine and Russia, but we have to avoid global conflict, mainly of course, uh, which would be ignited by, say, uh, China and the United States. Um, chapter 8 is about competition. And for me, of course, competition is, is good, but competition has to be based on common rules and norms. So it can't be about, you know, uh, competition wins because of scale and, and size uh, or because of pure, you know, protectionism. Because right now there is a tendency to bring value chains home, um, you know, things in the WTO are not advancing. How do we get, you know, global competition economically on a fair basis? Uh, and then chapter nine is about cooperation. How do we get back to multilateralism? How do we make and increase the relevance of the UN again? How do we make the WTO uh, more relevant? How do we find uh, more cooperation? And here my argument is that actually we'll probably witness the regionalization of globalization. So a lot of regional organizations like the European Union or, I don't know, say NAFTA or ASEAN or, or uh, uh, the African Union or CETA or uh, Mercosur uh, will have to take a, a leading role. And in the conclusion, which I finish off with, uh, I make the basic thesis of the book that the way in which we get out of this impasse, a world of disorder, is through dignified foreign policy. In other words, listening and having dialogue, finding common solutions, common institutions and common norms. And this will, of course, entail sacrifices both on the side of, of the West uh, and on the side, if you will, of the rest. We live in a very complex, multifaceted world with, with different types of uh, alliances. And I also have a conversation about um, utopias, dystopias, and e-utopias. The argument here being that, hey, let's stop pretending that we live in a perfect world. The world is basically a process. We try to find the best solutions. But my argument is that through regionalization of power, we will find that because we still, all of us have four global structural challenges that we have to deal with. Number one is demography. Number two is climate and climate change. Number three is economy and economic growth. And number four is technology. And in order for us to deal with these challenges as humans, we need to focus less on conflict, a little bit on competition, but mostly 
on uh, cooperation. I'm very optimistic uh, about where the world is going. Um, I think that it'll take a few years to get out of this disorder, go towards order. But eventually, when we start approaching the end of this century, uh, we will, of course, have a global order and will have solved many of the problems, not without black swans on the way. So this is my book about moving from a world of disorder to a world of order through dignified foreign policy and rethinking about international institutions. And I'd be really interesting, interested to hear, hear your views. Thanks for listening so far.